Bernard here. Uh, just give a brief introduction. Welcome to the HX webinar series, No Companies Left Behind. My name is Scott Jordan. I'm the founder of Health Yields Exchange, and I'm pleased to introduce Bill Moffat, chairman of emerging growth companies Glycer and Microvis. Um, Bill's got a very distinguished background. Uh, he's had exits, which uh, will be very uh, uh, intuitive for our audience to hear about best practices, and we really thank him for being on the line. Healthy Health Exchange is the premier investment marketplace dedicated exclusively to the global healthcare industry, employing crowdfunding as the cornerstone of a new funding paradigm. Healthy Health Exchange offers direct access to the broadest opportunities on a fee-free, carry-free basis. Um, since August 2nd, over 1,200 members have joined Healthy Health Exchange, including emerging growth company executives, accredited investors, investment professionals, and strategic buyers. First of all, let's go through the agenda real quick. So I'm going to introduce Bill more formally. He's going to talk a little bit about his background. We're going to get into Health Yields Exchange's mission and what is Health Yields Exchange, just real quick. Then we're going to talk about how Health Yields Exchange fills the value void. Some of the pe some people call it the innovation gap. HX crowdfunding portals. We're going to go uh, go through how we're not going to leave any company behind in the capital continuum. Will crowdfunding be enough? That'll be an interesting slide there. Bill Muffet will talk at the end about his best practices for all those uh, on the line that uh, are looking to raise capital. Um, you know, Bill has a distinguished background there, and obviously, I think he's um, you know growing in interest when it comes to crowdfunding, even though it's really in its earliest stages. And then, lastly, there'll be some contact information uh, for you to follow up with us if you have any questions. I'd be more than happy to talk one on one regarding listing your company, attracting investors, getting page views, and you know, obviously the end game is capital. So having said that, Bill, why don't you uh, take a few minutes, tell us about yourself, and uh, we'll go from there. Sure, Scott. Happy to do that, and thanks for the opportunity to participate today. Um, so I've, uh, I've been uh, 40 years in the medical device and diagnostics businesses. I started in 1973 as a sales rep with American Hospital Supply Corporation. I spent the first, uh, oh, 40 percent or so of my career in the big companies with American Hospital, and then in 1985, when Baxter acquired American, I went to Baxter. I'd say one of my first uh, entrepreneurial efforts, I actually came along, but tucked inside uh, American Hospital Supply Corporation, and that was the opportunity to build a division of that business uh, from, from scratch, if you will, uh, but albeit within the confines of the big mothership, so to speak. So within the comfort and safety and with the financing of a large uh, institution. Uh, at the uh, acquisition of American by Baxter, I went to Baxter. I continued to run a division there, but I also got my first exposure to the really tiny tech-driven outside entrepreneurial company. Uh, I ran the joint venture between Baxter and a company that would become MediSense which was the first electrochemical glucose sensor, ultimately a business uh, bought by Abbott. <clears throat> I was recruited out of Baxter and went to a company that uh, I believe actually on my first day of work maybe changed its name. It was uh, Integrated Ionics Incorporated. It became ISTAT. ISTAT was the world's first uh, lab on a chip company uh, and also pioneered the point of care space. Um, from ISTAT, uh, we uh, took that company public. Uh, eventually, uh, it was acquired by Abbott. I left uh, there and went on to a company in Chicago, Nanosphere. Nanosphere uh, pioneering nanoparticle technology for use in molecular diagnostics. Uh, the company is commercial. We got it public, retired from there earlier this year, and as Scott said, I now spend my time doing board work as I have done for the last several years, maybe as much as 10 years now. Um, I currently am chairman of uh, actually three companies. Uh, one is Glycure. Glycure is a company that is developing a chemically modified fiber optic to be used in a catheter uh, in, uh, in patients for continuous glycemic measurement and control in the ICU. We'll come back and talk about that a bit more later. Uh, Microvisc is another one. Microvisc is a company that has developed a handheld device for patients to self-test 
for monitoring warfarin or Coumadin anticoagulant therapy. Uh, and the third one is an absolute bare bones beginning startup, a company called Analyte Logic. Um, and it is developing chemically modified fiber optics for determination of arterial blood gases. Um, I also uh, sit on the boards of two other companies. Um, one, a company called SwipeSense, located in Evanston, Illinois, developing or has developed a um, hand uh, uh, sanitizer gel dispenser that uh, is hooked through an electronic system to track compliance, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the other company <clears throat> is um, um, a company that is um, located here in the U.S. as well, uh, and again in an early early stage of development. Then there's one more company, I, and I should not fail to mention a company uh, by the name of Base Four, and Base Four has a next generation gene sequencing technology. So I've been quite active in the med tech space. Uh, I've also done some board work in medical devices in addition to diagnostics. And we'll come back and talk about it in the best practices kind of discussion. But I was uh, just mulling over some notes here uh, and, and realized that I have been actually raising either private uh, venture capital or taking companies public since 1989. And in the course of time since 1989 to present have raised just at $1 billion in private and public financing in order to support these startup and growth uh, growth phase companies. Uh, and as you'll hear me say later on, it's getting tougher, not easier. Scott, I'll turn it back to you for a moment so you can provide some context on uh, what Healthios is doing to help people in regards to it getting tougher, not easier. Hey, Bill, thank you so much. It was very insightful. So we have a question here. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take this and Bill, if you have some comments as well, it would be appreciated. It says, it seems that traditional VCs have all but abandoned early stage uh, preclinical med tech deals, especially those that require a PMA pathway. How do you get through to investors that are still interested in backing preclinical PMA? So we're going to go through a series of slides. Obviously, crowdfunding, as enabled by the Jobs Act and the advances in social media, is an avenue that emerging growth companies can increasingly utilize and leverage uh, to raise capital. Even though we're in the early innings, general solicitation, of course, was was approved about a month ago. Um, we really there's there's great hopes that we will be able to take a slice from the three major capital sources right now. So. If you take a look at the Reg B market, that's a trillion-dollar market. It's largely dominated by public non-trader REITs and oil and gas, but there's also private placements in there. You have the Angels that in 2012 invested $22.5 billion in, in the over 60,000 deals worldwide. And then you have the VC bucket, and they invested $29 billion, I think it was $29.9 billion in 2012. And, 3,700 deals. The, the, the issue right now that we have is that uh, VC activity, you know, though rebounding, is still paltry compared to 2,000 levels. If you take a look at the number of VCs since two, uh, 2000, it's down 60, the number of companies is down 62%, uh, which is not good. The other thing is the aggregate uh, investment on an annual basis is down 14.8% since, since 2000. Uh, which is also problematic. And then lastly, in 2000, there was 466 venture capital firms that were active as defined by they've done four deals or they've invested $4 million on an annual basis. Today, there's less than 100 and, a handful, and only a handful of VCs that have raised funds. So it is going to rebound, I think, with the IPO market, by the way, um, but I think it's going to be challenging, and that's why we're here today to talk about crowdfunding. Bill, you want to talk anything about this uh, this question at all? Sure. Um, I, 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 first of all, I think the question was, have all but abandoned? You could take the all but out of the question. Um, I guess you could say VCs have essentially abandoned the, uh, high, the early stage uh, investment opportunities where there is very high risk. If you just look at it, I'll stop short of calling it the perfect storm, but it's close. Uh, what's happened in the last 10 years, uh, obviously everybody knows the early uh, after 2000, the fund, VC funds didn't do well. Uh, there are people beginning to question whether or not that model of you know, 2% and 20 
is actually a broken model now, go forward. The economy has caused a tremendous amount of money to move to the sidelines and wait. And at the same time, we've had the uncertainties in health care of uh, things like the Affordable Care Act, but perhaps even more noticeable, what appears to be a, uh, a tightening at the FDA. So combination of less money, fewer people willing to take the risk uh, for a window of time here, tightened up, increased risk uh, as a result of the FDA's actions, and it, uh, one can get the impression that it's rather bleak out there. Um, I actually I actually have a bit more uh, favorable outlook on this, if you will, uh, and I think Scott will probably speak to this as well. There's definitely money coming back into the system off the sidelines. Um, there is interest out there. I can say that in the last uh, two months, I've talked to two large venture capital firms who both have told me they're actually under a mandate. Uh, from the, the powers that be, if you will, their, their largest limited uh, investors, they're under a mandate to increase their rate of investment. Um, one of them, who for obvious reasons, will have to leave nameless, but it's one of the largest venture capital funds in the world, has been told they have to step up their investment rate to a number per year that approaches the size of most other funds in total. So there's money there. And it's another way of saying it's always been said in this industry, for the right deal, there's always money available. Now, you may have to struggle a bit with the terms, and it may take longer to find that money these days. It may t take a much better uh, business plan, a more well-crafted business plan. Um, we may have to find ways to create uh, validation of valuation sooner rather than later. Um, and I'd say one of the things that I think uh, this points to, there was a time back in the, I'll call it late 80s, early mid 90s, when the, the model for funding companies was essentially venture capital followed by an exit, and that exit could have been either an IPO, where the VCs after a lockup period of time could sell their shares in the open market, or a trade sale. Somebody came along and acquired the company. I'd say through the late 90s and certainly the early 2000s, we went through a period of time, and we're still in it, where IPOs don't represent exits. Uh, they represent additional financings, but there's, they really aren't a solid way for the venture investors to get out. That's put pressure back on them as well. So I think one of the things that you have to do today, and I find, uh, and I find us doing in the companies that I work with, is from the very beginning, we lay out a business plan uh, that takes us all the way through to uh, commercialization. Um, I don't think you can plan anymore to be bought somewhere along the way. That may be your desire, uh, but I think you need to plan for the long haul. So we plan the business plan all the way and layer right alongside that a financing strategy. And that financing strategy in many cases actually now has several components to it bluntly, all of which you'll find right here on the Health Yes Exchange site. Um, but, you know, it starts with perhaps high net worths, uh, individuals or angels or angel groups. And, and hopefully that capital, you can raise a sufficient amount of capital, you lay out exactly how much you need, and raise enough capital to get to a value inflection point, uh, proof of concept or something like that which will enable you to attract perhaps some of the earlier risk, uh, risk-taking uh, VCs, uh, which would lead you on to perhaps second VC rounds uh, to create, uh, you know, get through the regulatory processes, head toward commercialization. So I think it, where the old formula was VCs followed by an exit, uh, today's formula is uh, many, many different groups of investors along the timeline and growth curve of the company. Thanks, Bill. That was great. Uh, so let's just go through these slides real quickly. For those who've all been on previous webinars, some of these are some uh, the same, but it's we've got new people on, so it's important for us to kind of lay the foundation of the house before we actually get into this um, no company left behind. The the mission of Healthy Health Exchange, by the way, is a direct investing. I mean, that basically is what crowdfunding is, no two and 20. So you're expanding the access to capital. By the way, $60 billion in friends and family money. 
that goes into private placements worldwide. Uh, big number. Uh, enhance liquidity by deploying our scoring tools, which is coming next quarter. Heighten the rate of return for investors from a no-fee, no-carry basis. So it's a free portal. You don't have to pay a, um, a retainer to us. There is no two of the two and 20. And there is no 20, meaning there's no retainer or uh, there's no uh, carry on the back end. Ability to direct invest at 5,000 companies. Everyone's welcome. Seed to exit. Uh, we don't think crowdfunding alone is going to be able to get companies over the finish line. We basically look at it from, uh, they, they call it like meeting a series of milestones with capital, whether that is raising 500000 whether that's raising 1.5 or 3. You're trying to get to that next value inflection point so you can attract venture capitalists, family office money, foundation money, uh, strategics, et cetera, like Baxter, uh, Abbott, et cetera, here locally. Investor protection is really important here. No adverse deal selection. Total transparency, meaning uh, everything is, is, is visible except for confidential documents where uh, users will have to sign an NDA to get those documents and get the approval of management. We're very, very sensitive about IP. Um, we, need, we need to protect the interests of our constituents. And low investment thresholds, giving you the opportunity to diversify uh, which is a great investor protection because with the odds of 30 to 1 in a biotech side, you know, you'd rather put 5,000 into, you know, 20 companies than put 100 grand into one company. Uh, lastly, empower users to build community with the healthcare ecosystem. So a lot of LinkedIn functionality here, a lot of social media, friending, uh, you can message, you can share, you can follow companies and get catalyst updates. So there, uh, the, the essence of this is basically to link investors with companies, make it more efficient to grab on to those individuals, those accredited investors in this country that do not have a private placement in their portfolio. And by the way, most of them do not. Of the 8 million accredited investors in this country, only 5% have private placements in their portfolio. And one of the biggest reasons is they don't have access to them because they don't live in Boston or San Francisco and not in an angel group. Uh, they didn't want to join an angel group because you know, they don't want to pay the annual dues and the investment thresholds are too high. So the Kaufman study, real quick, uh, this came out. It said the two, basically what they're saying is 2 and 20 doesn't work very well. And we incorporated certain things into our portal. We have four different portals. You'll see them, crowd finance, express, in-market, and fee-free, carry-free. So we took the, the, the Kaufman study recommendations. We built those into the portals, and you'll see some of the results and benefits. But essentially, it's just meaning direct investing, get you know basically co-invest with VCs, right? Uh, move companies into the public markets and reduce these fee structures. Okay, uh, Health Deals Exchange online investment marketplace dedicated exclusively to global healthcare industry. We don't have 100,000 credit investors in there yet, but it's building by the day, and that's going to be our goal next year. Family offices are in there. Private banks, high net worth, foreign trusts. We're trying to eradicate the value void which is basically the inability or reluctance of venture capital to invest in early stage companies, either because they don't have money or uh, they have a huge fund and can't put enough money to work. Accelerate access to capital, broaden liquidity alternatives, maximize company value, enhance capital efficiency, reduce cost, uh, getting rid of a 2 and 20. So really it's matched, the structure of Health Yields exchange, exchange is matched to the unique structure of healthcare, you'll see here. You've seen this. Everybody on the uh, phone knows what this is, but it's an end-to-end -end solution, and you'll see how this works in a second. But you know, we we also supplement it with conferences. We've got research, LinkedIn groups, scoring. You'll see a lot of these different things that that we provide to our constituents in the portal for free. So Healthios Exchange fills the value void. So what is the value void? Like like we said, it's uh, this innovation gap, right? The irrational systematic dysfunctions or gaps in the global healthcare capital flows. So you'll see some of the stars here. Um, you know, it's been a great year uh, for IPOs. There's no doubt about it. That's really going to help the industry. But we're really far from having a meaningful seed to exit capital continuum uh, that's functioning uh, well. So most of the VCs, you know, obviously go in these syndicates. So you're not seeing a lot of distribution of capital across the board between San Francisco, especially uh, between San Francisco and Boston. The health field, we're filling the value void. So 
So here, here's really that seed deck that where crowd finance starts on the left-hand side. These are typically non-venture-backed companies that are in crowd finance. Uh, the typical capital raise probably is going to be anywhere between 500000 to 1.5. You've got Foundation Place, which is venture philanthropy. Venture philanthropy. Think Coladico with Vertex Cystic Fibrosis. Um, rich people have alternative motives other than just more wealth, uh, and that's social good. Express, Exclusive Preferred Emerging Growth Sponsored Security, that is basically sidecars with venture firms, which is very interesting. In market, pipes at the market transactions and direct listings, and then in the future we'll be building out LiquidNet, which is a secondary trading platform. Let's take a look at the portals real quick. When we talk about no company left behind, what it means is if you're in crowd finance or you're in the foundation place side, you're looking for non-dilutive capital, we, we don't uh, create orphan companies, meaning you know you raise 500 grand on crowd, crowd finance and you sit there because you can't raise any more money. So you go from crowd finance to foundation place, seed exit to express to end market. Okay? And this is really what the member homepage looks like. You'll start once again on the left-hand side from crowd finance all the way through in market left to right. And uh, by the way, those are some companies below that we'll be funding. By the way, we're not funding yet. We're going to be pulling that trigger shortly. We're just trying to make sure we've got enough investors, credit investors in the portal to make sure that we can fund companies adequately on a wide scale. Uh, once again, 5,000 companies. Each one has a company page. Uh, they are organized by ecosystem companies, strategics, and foundations, and family offices and venture capitalists can create watch lists where they can get automated. This is probably one of the most robust investment re investor relations tools because all of the followers or they create these watch lists will get your updates on a monthly basis. We also are building out obviously our accredited investor side, the member side. And then we also have a robust research platform to assist you with not only looking at the merits of a company, but a sector. So what's the IPO activity in oncology versus cardiovascular devices? Uh, how much M&A activity is going on? Who's, you know, how much liquidity is in that? What's, what's, how many funding rounds? Who are the most active VCs? So all free, by the way. And then our scoring, coming out first quarter 2014, we're going to be scoring companies, uh, stack ranking them in pharmaceuticals, medical device, and healthcare services. We've got, this is a quant, uh, uh, quantitative model, by the way. We are going to introduce some qualitative measures and patents, et cetera, uh, because you can't say, I have more patents and less patents, and more is better. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But uh, we'll be releasing this in first quarter and the top quartile companies will be able to fundraise on the site if you're not in the top quartile uh, based on the scoring, which by the way the scoring changes every month based on your catalyst activity. You can be sponsored by somebody like Bill or a major VC or a strategic. This is what your company page would look like. So you'll see here on the upper right hand corner that's where your score would be. This will be touched by 100 so that would be 67 so it'll be the 67th best co uh, company in the pharma space. Uh, fundraising targets, you'll see them there. Deal points down below. Minimum, maximum use of proceeds. Description of the company. You'll have the opportunity to talk with management directly. You could post your highlights and you could post your public documents. And if you hit the red button, that's where people submit the amount of money that they're seeking to put into the company as well as $1,500 per investor. And that invest, those investments are aggregated in the special purpose vehicles that act as one LP. So that's uh, so. This is really the heart of the system: are these company pages, and of course we have offline partnerships that Bill I think has participated at, where we have offline meets online. So will crowdfunding be enough? So I basically said not yet. There's uh, really, if you take a look at the empirical evidence, you know, on average, the successful pharmaceutical companies raise 49 million over 5.7 year period. There's really no way right now for crowdfunding to be able to fill that gap. Right now, the largest raise, to my knowledge, is around three million dollars. But that's why, if you go down to the bottom there, securing capital C to exit is a must. So you have to, I think, have uh, relationships and work with a tool 
that doesn't create orphans, <clears throat> doesn't leave, leave companies behind. So we've got, as Bill knows, we've got very strong relationships with the venture capitalists and the family offices, et cetera. So having said that, Bill, and I've talked too much already, but Bill, maybe you can go through a little bit about the companies you've been successful with raising, raising capital and maybe a few examples of challenging times of you right. know, the inability to raise capital. All right. Uh, yep. Maybe you could take, take some of our participants through that. Sure, absolutely. And I'm going to start, I'm going to lay out for you what I think are three absolute best practices you have to maintain, and then I'm going to use each of those to uh, discuss some of the uh, uh, examples there, Scott. The first one is uh, when, you, when you get anywhere you are, you're in, in any phase in your current company, if you don't have a business plan that takes you all the way through commercialization and it has attached to it a parallel financing strategy plan. If you don't have that, I encourage you to make it because it's going to be the guide, the guide all the way along. Uh, you will find that if you focus only on short term, and by short term I mean like one year kind of numbers, year and a half kind of numbers for financing, it's easily it's easy to fall into certain traps that are going to be painful for you later on. So I would advise you to lay out a financing plan, and in that regard, I do think Healthy House Exchange is, is a good guide post along the way. What am I going to start with? What kind of investors will I start with? Uh, when is the right time to try to seek venture capital? Does my company uh, sort of fit with a family office uh, uh, investment or not? Uh, at what point do I want to get the strategic players, the big corporations involved, who might someday represent uh, an acquirer of, of the company, if you will? When is the right time to get them involved? Should I take money from them? Shouldn't I? That sort of thing. You need to think through all of that and lay out a plan. I guarantee you the plan you lay out to start with will change, but nonetheless, it's a good starting point. And it will help you avoid uh, what is number two on my list, which is allowing valuation of the company to get way ahead of the company. No question, you're always under pressure to build value and increase shareholder value as a private company or as a public company. But particularly as a private company, in the early days, if you seek out, for example, um, a high net worth individuals, uh, sophisticated people making direct investments in your company, you know, they're going to look for a return. At the same time, if you, are, if you develop to a point where at some point you take in a venture capital round, uh, you run a high risk of getting uh, at cross purposes, if you will, at that juncture. The venture capital uh, investor is going to come in and run the formula backwards, if you will. What is the exit point? What do we think the valuation can be at that exit point? If we back up from there, how much capital does it take to get from our current position to that exit point? How much are we, the venture capitalists, going to put in in terms of that capital that's required? And what are we going to get as a return? And they're going to start looking for a 5 to 10x return. Trust me, they're happy to get 2, 3, 4. But they're going to start with a formula that will say 5 to 10x return. And that will back end them into what they believe the current value of your company is. If you've allowed individual investors, high net worth individuals, angel groups, or whomever, to press the value of the company too high too fast, you can see what's coming. In order to get access to the capital you really need, the larger sums of money that can be had from venture capitalists, you're going to wind up with a down round and it's going to be very painful for your existing uh, investors. So I would say number two best practice is always keep an eye on how exit valuation will affect some future venture capital round and don't let valuation of the company get too far ahead. I'll leave the names out, but one of the companies I'm working with right now has this problem. The valuation got way ahead of where it should have and fr frankly got way ahead of, of the development of the company and now going through looking for a next venture capital round 
you know, there's the reality that this current round that we were successful in doing it may wind up being a bit of a down round for the existing investors. So that would be number two. And my number three would uh, best practice would be uh, stay in constant communication, constant communication with your investors, with prospective investors as well. Even if they say no, we're not going to invest now, just stay in touch. Stay in touch with them, keep them posted because things change in their world, things change in your world. Um, that's also a, 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 a benefit, I believe, of this whole Healthy Oats Exchange site. And I don't mean to sound like a commercial for Healthy Oats Exchange, but in full disclosure, frankly, two of my companies are going to use this um, for this very reason. This is a great way to keep public, very, you know, to the, to, the, to the sophisticated investors here who sign on to this, to keep in front of them the developments in your company. If you think about it, tools like Healthy Oats Exchange are going to do to the investment world what WebMD and the Internet did to the medical world. Most people who walk into a physician today with some sort of ailment probably know as much about that ailment as the doctor does if they've done their homework and dug in on the, on the Internet to find out what the symptoms are, potential treatments, you know, experimental cures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, many times people find themselves knowing more than the doctor does about a particular medical problem they may have. What the uh, uh, sites like Healthios Exchange are going to do is allow the sophisticated investors to essentially bypass the, uh, the, the groups, if you will, the traditional venture capitalists and come straight to the companies. Uh, th they could come in the form of angel groups, they could come in the form of individual high net worth folks. Um, two, three of the companies that I deal with today uh, have investments from individuals, and 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 make no mistake, there are mistakes. There are individuals out there who are fully capable of writing million dollar checks, and will do so for the right kinds of investments. So I think the communication here uh, to the investment community is going to be enabled like, by sites like Healthios Exchange. If you think about it, there are more deals now than they've ever been in the past, more companies looking for money than they've ever been in the past. And because of this diversification of sources of capital, there are more investors than they've ever been in the past. And so how do you get more deals, more investors to communicate and get that communication out there clearly? It's going to be through tools like this. So if we think about some of the, the ones that have gone well, maybe some of the ones that haven't gone so well, um, I think back, um, uh, both iStat and Nanosphere uh, were companies that were initially venture capital funded. Uh, there were no uh, individuals, if you will, that participated in the early investments in those companies. They were all venture capital firms. Both companies uh, we took public uh, at a what you would argue is probably a reasonably early stage of development. Both companies went public just prior to actually being able to launch and sell a product, uh, but both had very compelling technologies. Uh, both companies raised or have raised it, and Nanosphere is still, still there, has not been acquired. Both companies raised or have raised uh, well in excess of $200 million. Now maybe a side note here, I think if I had gone to the original investors in ISTAT and said, uh, folks, do you realize uh, in order to uh, put this platform in the marketplace, uh, it's going to take uh, 250 million dollars. Are you ready to get started? I suspect many of them would have said, mm, "Thanks, but no thanks." Um, so it's a different way of saying we realize, and everybody realizes, all these companies cost more and take longer than anyone envisions because they run into various things along the way. So while it's important to lay out that financing plan, that financing strategic plan along the way, it's also important to realize you do have to achieve, obviously, these value-creating uh, interim milestones along the way and know how much capital it takes to get from one to the next. Um, ISTAT was successful in raising venture capital. Uh, we were fortunate in our initial public offering. Uh, we actually had uh, the last private round we did before taking the company public, 
had a collar included in it, a ratchet mechanism, if you will, that if the company uh, were to exit within a two-year window of time and the, the new investors didn't at least double their money, uh, then they would made, be made whole by further dilution of the previously existing uh, shareholders, uh, which was interesting because we took the company public 23 months after that deal, one month within that two-year window. Uh, and we were fortunate. We did, with a pre-money valuation on the IPO, actually uh, uh, create a pre-money valuation that was greater than two times that, uh, that investment. So the, the, the ratchet never took effect. But that was the kind of vehicle we had to use in order to get the level of capital we needed to get the company to that, uh, to that inflection point. Uh, Nanosphere was also venture capital funded uh, up until the point uh, that it went public. Uh, fortunate again there to go uh, public at a uh, at, at a very good valuation. So I would say um, you know both of those companies, while there are always challenges, uh, there are always uh, needs to balance the vested interests. Um, I think it's interesting to note. Uh, I'll, I'll leave again leave the name of the company out for confidentiality reasons. But one of the companies I've worked with um, in one of the venture rounds company was out looking to raise a certain amount of money, um, think middle digit, middle double digits, you know, 30 million, 40 million or so. Uh, and uh, the institutional VCs that were interested in the deal came back and basically said two things. One, we don't think that's enough money. We want to see you raise a much larger number. And two, we want it all. Um, so now that sounds like a wonderful outcome. It's in fact a problem because it's a problem for the existing investor. So you not only have to look at the sources of money and lay out where you're going to get the money, but you've also got to think seriously about balancing the interests and the almost the personalities, if you will, of the investors. Um, so there are a lot of balls in the air, things to be managed along the way. Uh, and let me think about challenges here. Um, it, uh, so uh, one, two, three of the companies that I'm working with right now are out looking for capital. One is an extremely early stage company, and uh, frankly, we are trying to make the transition from individuals over to some early stage venture capital. Um, and, and I can't tell you how successful it will or won't be because we're in the middle of it right now. But I can tell you it is very challenging, very difficult. Um, the, uh, one of the other companies is a company that's been venture funded from the beginning, uh, been very, very capital efficient. Um, and we're out looking to raise some money that will bridge us to a larger round to support full commercialization. It's a different way of saying we didn't have quite enough money in the bank to make it to the next real value inflection point. Uh, and frankly, we're looking for some high net worth individuals to help fill that bridge. Um, and that's going along about as you'd expect. It's not easy. It's, it's just not as easy to raise money as it used to be. Um, but uh, it, it's going along so far fairly well. Another one of the companies that's uh, looking to raise capital right now uh, is a company that is venture backed. Uh, we actually just finished a round that was to uh, bridge us over to a larger venture round after the first of the year. That round uh, was uh, marketed to high net worth individuals and frankly was oversubscribed, uh, which in and of itself creates a bit of a problem uh, because it can create more dilution than anyone wants to take before achieving that next venture round. Uh, so, uh, so far, I'd say, and knock on a piece of wood here, um, they, you know, the companies that I've been working with have done okay in the area of raising capital. But make no mistake, it is much harder than it used to be. Scott, I don't know if that stimulates any questions or thoughts on your mind. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's great. Uh, just, uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're running uh, low on time here, but let's. Uh, there's a question or two. One of them uh, was just answered. It said, have, "How successful have you been at raising you know, capital from accredited investors? Obviously, you have some background there. Is successful? What were the hurdles in the time frame? What were the sources?" of you know of where you met these investors was it friends and family was it uh, intros uh, from venture capital firms from seed funds lawyers what you know maybe you could talk a little bit about 
the source of how you met your credit investor. Sure, absolutely. One of the one of the companies that's just concluded uh, this one that was oversubscribed. Um, it uh, it has an oversubscription amount laying there of about uh, three million dollars, and uh, all of that, virtually all. I can't say all 100%, but virtually all of that comes from individuals writing checks. And those checks are anywhere from $30,000 to uh, oh, three quarters of a million, half a million. Um, all of those individuals came as a result of networking. Uh, there are a lot of folks out in the marketplace today. Uh, you can call them introducers. You can call them brokers. Call them what you will. They have networked themselves in to these high net worth individuals and other brokers who know yet another group of high net worth individuals. Um, and uh, if you can start with those folks, they'll make the introductions. Um, you can think of them, if you will, as an investment banker, um, although in many cases they are just individuals. I will say this, I think it helps to have someone who doesn't do this on a casual basis for you, but is hired to do this. Uh, and will devote you know significant amounts of their time to it. Um, they are generally because they have this sort of stable of people they go back to over and over again. Um, they generally are selective about the kinds of things they'll represent, the stage of development, that sort of thing. Um, and then they will make these introductions and try to sponsor and support the company along the way. So we've made good use in uh, in uh, three of the companies that I work with, the three that are out looking to raise money, we made good use of such individuals. Uh, they were either known by the company already uh, or because they'd approached the company in the past, or uh, we got introduced to them. But they're out there. You can network and you can find them, uh, and uh, and they'll happily give you references. You can check with other companies that have used them and see uh, see how they do. Now, I will tell you their fees tend to be a little high, so you have to uh, you have to uh, you know, include that, if you will, in the total amount of capital that you need. But they're there. Thanks. Uh, I will say that uh, crowdfunding is is trying to make that whole process more efficient. Uh, first of all, by matching the investors with the companies based on the investor preferences of the investor, uh, whether it's a financing stage, whether it's the development stage. Um, you know, identifying those investors and putting them in touch with you, and then basically not having to pay the business brokers their big fees that Bill just mentioned. So that's the key, and obviously we're using a lot of LinkedIn tools to get companies to that point. So unfortunately we're out of time, but I just want to say once again, thank you so much, Bill, for your participation on this, uh, on this uh, webinar. And if you guys, uh, if you would like to get a hold of us, um, feel free to give me a call. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about the portal itself. And, and, and Bill's uh, email address is here. So thanks again, guys. Enjoy it, Scott. Thanks. Take care. Thanks so much.